Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. Chapter 2, The Tree of Knowledge. So in the previous chapter, we saw that although Sapiens had already populated East Africa 150,000 years ago, we began to see that they overrun the entire planet and drive other human species and other animals to extinction only about 70,000 years ago. And so we see this cognitive revolution occur around 30 to 70,000 years ago amidst this time. And this cognitive revolution is characterized by humans' ability to communicate effectively in large groups, unlike any other species. Unlike our chimpanzee cousins, who in troops maybe max out at around 100, very maximum, and then after that, instability and destabilization occurs. So why is this? Why is there, why are we so able to communicate effectively and cooperate effectively so differently to our chimpanzee cousins and every single other animal species? Well, one reason we and they suspect is because we are unique in the way that we have this complex way of communicating that enables us to create fiction and gossip and imagined realities in order to collectively work together as a group. And so we're going to discuss in this chapter how this appearance of this new way of thinking and communicating constituted the cognitive revolution. But what caused it? We're not sure. The most commonly believed theory argues that accidental genetic mutations change the inner wirings of the brains of sapiens, enabling them to think in unprecedented ways and to communicate using an altogether new type of language. So we should ask, how did we get here? Why are we so different? Because no other species cooperates and communicates like us. Homo sapiens, very social animal. Social cooperation is key for our survival and reproduction. It is not enough for individual men and women to know the whereabouts of lions and bison. It's much more important for them to know who in their band hates whom, who is sleeping with whom, who is honest, who is a cheat. The amount of information that one must obtain and store in order to track the ever-changing relationships of even a dozen individuals is staggering. In a band of 50 individuals, there are 1,225 one-on-one relationships and a countless more complex social combinations. Apes, chimpanzees, very different. It's relatively easy to agree that only Homo sapiens can speak about things that don't really exist and believe six impossible things before breakfast. You can never convince a monkey to give you a banana by promising, promising him limitless bananas after death in monkey heaven. Yet we do that. But why is this important? After all, fiction can be dangerously misleading or distracting. People who go to the forest looking for fairies and unicorns would seem to have less chance of survival than people who go looking for mushrooms and deer. And if you spend hours praying to non-existent guardian spirits, aren't you wasting precious time better spent foraging, fighting, and fornicating? Well, maybe not. Maybe there's this balance that fiction provides us where other animals, to our knowledge, do not and cannot create. Fiction has enabled us not merely to imagine things, but to do so collectively. We can weave common myths such as biblical creation story, the dreamtime myths of Aboriginal Australians, and the nationalist myths of modern states. Such myths give sapiens the unprecedented ability to cooperate flexibly in large numbers. And we call them myths because they're imagined. They're not part of objective reality. It's not something you see. It's something that we created as a result of an imagined, fictionalized reality. Or it's something we just imagine as myth. Which we'll get into in later chapters. Is that religion? When two males are contesting the alpha position, they usually do so by forming extensive coalitions of supporters, both male and female, within the group. Ties between coalition members are based on intimate, daily contact, hugging, touching, kissing, grooming, mutual favors. Okay? By the way, we're talking about chimpanzees. Now, on the other hand, just as human politicians on election campaigns go around shaking hands and kissing babies, so 
Aspirants to the top position in a chimpanzee group spend much time hugging, backslapping, and kissing baby chimps. When you strip back and compare individual to individual, human to chimp, we're not that different from a behavioral, primitive behavioral perspective. The alpha male usually wins his position not because he's physically stronger, but because he leads a large and stable coalition. These coalitions play a central part not only, not only during overt struggles for the alpha position, but in almost all day-to-day -day activities. Members of a coalition spend more time together, share food, and help one another in times of trouble. This is the utility of teams, coalitions, groups, large groups of people gathering together, and, you know, troops of chimpanzees gathering together you can more effectively gain the outcome you're desiring and the collective can benefit in a more valuable way than the individual could. Now, here's the thing we mentioned and I mentioned at the start, that as the number of chimpanzees in a troop increases, the social order destabilizes, eventually leading to a rupture and the formation of a new troop by some of the animals. Only in a handful of cases have zoologists observed groups larger than 100. Separate groups seldom cooperate and tend to compete for territory and food. Researchers have documented prolonged warfare between groups and even one case of genocidal activity in which one troop systematically slaughtered most members of a neighboring band. We have seen this throughout history when you have desolate communities who have been, you know, war-torn countries, terrorist activity, natural disasters, and it's even been fictionalized in entertainment, seemingly to accurate depiction where you'll see groups of people, well, you'll see any one of these catastrophic, catastrophic events occur, groups form together, groups are pitted against each other. You see these type of genocidal activity where groups will fight to the death to survive. So it's interesting we see these similar patterns across humans and chimps. And similar patterns probably dominated the social lives of early humans, including archaic homo sapiens. Humans like chimps have social instincts that enabled our ancestors to form friendships and hierarchies and hunt or fight together. However, like the social instincts of chimps, those of humans were adapted only for small intimate groups. When the group grew too large, its social order destabilized and the band split. Even if a particularly fertile valley could feed 500 archaic sapiens, there was no way that so many st strangers could live together. How could they agree who should be a leader, who should hunt where, or who should mate with whom? In the wake of the cognitive revolution, gossip helped homo sapiens to form larger and more stable bands. But even gossip has its limits. limits. Sociological research has shown that the maximum natural size of a group bonded by gossip is only about 150 individuals. Most people can neither intimately know nor gossip effectively about more than 150 human beings. So how are we functioning today in groups much larger? Even today, a critical threshold in human organizations falls somewhere around the map magic number. Below this threshold, communities, businesses, social networks, and military units can maintain themselves based on intimate acquaintances and rumor mongering. There is no need for formal ranks, titles, etc. A platoon of 30 soldiers or even a company of 100 soldiers can function well on the basis of intimate relations with a minimum of formal discipline. A small family business can survive and flourish without a board of directors, a CEO. But once the threshold of 150 individuals is crossed, things can no longer work that way. You cannot run a division with thousands of soldiers the same way you can run a platoon. Successful family businesses usually face crisis when they grow larger and hire more personnel. They cannot reinvent themselves. How did Homo sapiens manage to cross this critical threshold, eventually founding cities comprising tens of thousands of inhabitants and empires ruling hundreds of millions? The secret was probably the appearance of fiction. Large numbers of strangers can cooperate successfully by believing in common myths. I think this is one of the most magical ideas in this book. One of the most profound ideas in this book that all of this is woven together just by fiction and ideas and myths. It's quite amazing. 
to me to realize that without, we, we all just agree, subconsciously and consciously, it's all these written and unwritten rules of society, of the society that we have governed and created. And we've drawn lines on a map and we've decided we're going to create different cultures which are a result of the fictions and, and imagined realities that we've created. And each country, we're going to create countries, put lines on a map, and each state and country is going to have its own slightly different or largely different imagined realities. And then we're going to create treaties and laws and conventions to govern communication between states and actors that have such, such different imagined realities. And we're going to make it work for the most part. We're all still here. We haven't blown each other up yet. Yet none of these things exists outside of the stories that people invent and tell one another. There are no gods in the universe, no nations, no money, no human rights, no laws, and no justice outside the common imagination of human beings. People easily understand that primitives cement their social order by believing in ghosts and spirits and gathering each full moon to dance together around a campfire. That we fail to appreciate is that our modern institutions function on exactly the same basis. Take for example the world of business and corporations. They function in the similar roots to which we believe in ghosts and spirits. We've just agreed on one of them. As opposed to collectively being skeptical and rather denying another. It could have easily been the other. But telling effective stories is not easy. The difficulty lies not in telling the story, but in convincing everyone else to believe it. How did we do that? Millions of people, billions of people across the world all believe we all, you know what the imagined reality collective story we all believed in was with what happened, what is happening right now, 2020, 2021. We all agreed collectively to certain behavioral tendencies and stories with social behavior, with masks, with the need and necessity to perform certain drastic actions. And so effective stories had to be told. Much of history revolves around this question. How does one convince millions of people to believe particular stories about gods or nations or limited liability companies? Yet when it succeeds, it gives sapiens immense power because it enables millions of strangers to cooperate and work towards common goals. And there's something we have seen and are seeing right now. Just try to imagine how difficult it would have been to create states or churches or legal systems if we could only speak about things that really exist, such as rivers, trees, or lions. Things that we can only see. We can't see a god, but we can imagine it. Over the years, people have woven an incredibly complex network of stories. Within this network, fictions such as you know, car companies like Peugeot not only exist, but also accumulate immense power. The kinds of things that people create through this network of stories are known in academic circles as fictions, social constructs, or imagined realities. An imagined reality is not a lie. I lie when I say there's a lie near the river when I know when there isn't one. Unlike lying, an imagined reality is something that everyone believes in. And as long as this communal belief persists, the imagined reality exerts force in the world. This is, re this is really interesting. I'm going to repeat that. So it's not like lying. Imagined reality is something that everyone believes in. And as long as this communal belief persists, the imagined reality exerts force on the world. So we all, the majority, maybe not everybody, but the majority, there has to be a critical threshold of uh, belief amongst the population for it to persist in and exert itself in behavior and be accepted. I don't know, is this 51% out of 100? Is this like just crushing the halfway threshold? Maybe it is. It's, it's how we do our, 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 a lot of our voting systems. You get a majority share. And that's when the power of imagined realities becomes, is when we get a majority believing in it. Ever since the cognitive revolution, sapiens have thus been living in a dual reality. On one hand, the objective reality of rivers, trees, and lions. On the other hand, the imagined reality of gods, nations, and corporations. As time went by, the imagined reality became ever more powerful. 
so that today the very survival of rivers, trees, and lines depends on the grace of imagined entities such as the United States and Google, such as the imagined realities of zoos, of corporations that help the pro proliferation and survival of, of these these animals that are objective reality. It's our imagined reality that helps our objective reality now. It's like a interwoven interconnectedness that is so deep rooted that there's no going back. We're too, we're too smart. You know, I often joke that how stupid we are, but we're also too smart because no other species communicates collectively like we do. And so also we're stuck by our, by our own intelligence and like the cognitive revolution has caused well everything we see and everything we interact with the societies that we we operate within because a society is just a collective imagined reality so this was the key to sapiens success in a one-on-one -on -one brawl a neanderthal probably would have beaten his sapiens but in a, so because we talked about how like why why did neanderthals die out you know it could be a couple of different theories well what, one thing neanderthals that we are relatively confident in didn't have is our collective cooperation to work together in large groups and create fiction because in a conflict of hundreds neanderthals wouldn't stand a chance against homo sapiens Neanderthals could share information about the whereabouts of lions, but they probably could not tell and revise stories about tribal spirits. Without an ability to compose fiction, Neanderthals were unable to cooperate effectively in large groups, nor could they adapt their social behavior to rapidly changing challenges. While we can't get inside the mind of Neanderthal to understand how they thought, we have indirect evidence of the limits of their cognitive capacity, compared with their sapient rivals. Archaeologists excavated a 30,000 year old sapien site in the European heartland and they occasionally find their, uh, found their seashells from the Mediterranean and Atlantic coasts. In all likelihood, these shells got to the continental interior through long distance trade through different sapiens bands. So Neanderthal sites lack any evidence of such trade. Each group manufactured its own tools from local materials. So we're, we're, it's, we're implying from archaeological evidence Neanderthals did not appear like they had the capacity or that they performed trade alike to what we did. Trade may seem very pragmatic activity, one that needs no fictive basis, yet the fact is that no other animal other than sapiens engages in trade and all the sapiens trade networks about which we have detailed evidence were based on fictions trading seashells like the trade of like creating currency that's a fictionalized reality i'm gonna we're gonna agree both of us are gonna agree that this is worth something this seashell is worth x value it's worth that water or that much food and we're gonna collectively agree that this objective reality like a seashell is worth worth something which is the fictionalized reality in exchange for something else an objective reality like food another resource the fact is that no other animals other than sapiens engages in trade and all the sapiens trade networks about which we have detailed evidence for based on fictions trade cannot exist without trust and it is very difficult to trust strangers thus gossip and imagine realities was the bridge between how we trust each other. It, it, it was the bridge, it acted as a gateway to trust. And that's another component that is really important for the evolution of our species, is that we, you wouldn't most likely say most animals in the animal kingdom trust each other. There's not much uh, objective uh, behavioral tendencies that demonstrate trust. Now, on the basis of trust is the foundation of an agreed fictional reality and agreed value of something in exchange for something else. The global network of today is based on trust in such fictional entities as the dollar, the Federal Reserve Bank, the totemic trademarks of copper corporations. When two strangers in tribal society want to trade, they will often establish trust by appealing to a common god, mythical ancestor, 
or total totem animal. Now, we put trust in five-star reviews. We put trust in people's word. We put trust in terms and conditions. We put trust in the law and legal system. We put trust in imagined realities. But these are just imagined realities. So there's a fickle nature to it all. There's a, there's a finality and a... It can all disappear. Type of feeling to it all. But we have a trust in the whole system in of itself that it is quite stable based on history, present, re and present reality. So everything is still functioning. What we see with our own two eyes and what we hear makes us trust that the system, imagined reality of all these entities, we should continue to trust them because it seems like they, they've worked, they're still working, and they are likely to continue to work Otherwise, we may need to reinvent them. Not that we will get rid of them, but that we will just adjust them, adapt them, and reinvent them. One that is happening right now is causing a lot of disruption is, is currency. In a hundred years' time, will we be exchanging currency in the form of physical printed money? Or will it be all virtual? Men and women much smarter than me can reflect on that so in summary what happened in the cognitive revolution so we uh, we had a new ability what was our new ability well one was the ability to transmit larger quantities of information about the world surrounding homo sapiens what was a wider consequence of that planning and carrying out complex actions such as avoiding lions and hunting bison number two it's another new ability the ability to transmit larger quantities of information about sapient social relationships that consequently enabled larger and more cohesive groups numbering up to 150 individuals the last new ability is the ability to transmit information about things that don't really exist such as tribal spirits nations com limited liability companies human rights and the consequence of that is the cooperation between very large numbers of strangers and rapid innovation of social behavior. You see, and that's a really good word, innovation. Innovation, progress, doesn't, does, it, does it occur without the cognitive revolution? Does it occur as rapidly? Likely not. Probably not. Without our ability to create fictional realities it serves as like a, a major pillar for innovation to which we can agree to something and that we can agree to all right to progress something to build this something now to have an aim and ambition now to make it greater and better history in biology the immense diversity of imagined realities that sapiens invented and the resulting diversity of behavior patterns are the main components of what we call cultures once cultures appear, they never cease to change and develop, and these unstoppable alterations are what we call history. The cognitive revolution is accordingly the point when history declared its independence from biology. It's quite a clever, profound connection that he's making between history and biology, and I don't even pretend like I can really like fathom the, the last point of history declaring its independence from biology. It's kind of a metaphor maybe of sorts it's demonstrating a stepping stone that we've made and that a distinction that we've made that's quite different from every other species and that our cultures our societies are built on imagined realities and that which supports a whole range of diversity that we see across the planet a diversity that we don't see quite as much in animals other animal species our societies are built from the same building blocks as Neanderthal or chimpanzee societies. And the more we examine these building blocks, sense, like sensations, emotions, family ties, the less difference we actually find between us and apes. Like primitively, like I was saying earlier, there's not much major difference, at least from like a behavioral primitive perspective. However, it is a mistake to look for the differences at the level of the individual, the family. One-on-one, -on -one, even 10 on 10, we are embarrassingly similar to chimpanzees. 
Now, significant differences begin to appear only when we cross the threshold of 150 individuals. And when we reach 1,000 to 2,000 individuals, the differences are astounding. If you tried to gather a bunch of chimps in Tiananmen Square, Wall Street, or the Vatican, pandemonium, chaos, chimps everywhere, hurling feces and eating bananas, kicking over trash cans, chaos. By contrast, sapiens regularly gather by thousands of such places. Together, they create orderly patterns such as trade, networks, mass celebrations, and political institutions they could never have created in isolation. Maybe with the occasional feces throwing, but it's all agreed upon. Someone will pick it up. Someone will put it in a bin. It will get taken somewhere. We agree on that. The real difference between us and chimpanzees is the mythical glue that binds together large numbers of individuals, families and groups. The glue has made us the masters of creation. I think that's, an, that's another good word for it. It's like the glue. I called it a bridge, but the glue, the bridge, the connection that this mythology that we have created has connects us all. Of course, we also needed other skills, such as the ability to make and use tools. Yet tool making is of little consequence unless it is coupled with the ability to cooperate with many others. Physiologically, there's been no significant improvement in our tool making capacity over the last 30,000 years. Einstein was far less dexterous with his hands than was an ancient hunter gatherer. However, our capacity to cooperate with large numbers of strangers has improved dramatically. The ancient flint spearhead was manufactured in minutes by a single person who relied on the advice and help of a few intimate friends. And the production of modern nuclear warheads required the cooperation of millions of strangers all over the world. From the workers who mine the uranium, to the theoretical physicists who write the mathematical formula. Everything that we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis, almost everything, is built upon the foundation of imagined reality. It's just like, oh yeah, it's just all made up. It's like, when you really think about it, it's just all made up. And that's like, that's pretty crazy to me. That's pretty crazy to me. To summarize the relationship between biology and history after the cognitive revolution, A, biology sets the basic parameters for the behavior and capacity of, capacities of Homo sapiens. The whole of history takes place within the bounds of this biological arena. B. However, this arena is extraordinarily large, allowing sapiens to play an astounding variety of games. Thanks to their ability to invent fiction, sapiens create more and more complex games, which each gener generate, develop, and elaborate even further. I wrote in one of my Dear Alexander posts uh, on medium.com and my website about games. It's one of my favorite, most profound kind of lessons, life, life reflective lessons. Um, so we're all playing games. We all just, like, life is a series of games that we all agree to play. You know, whether it's the, the you know, it could be just as general as, like, the money game, the, the success game, the pursuit of knowledge and education game, the, uh, the game of meaning and fulfillment. Like, and they're all built on imagined realities. C. Consequently, in order to understand how sapiens behave, we must describe the historical evolution of their actions. Referring only to our biological constraints would be like a radio sportscaster who, attending the World Cup Football Championship, offers his listeners a detailed description of the playing field rather an account of what the players are doing. And so that, that's the connection between the biology constraints that we have and now connecting the cognitive capacity that we exhibit through these imagined fictional myth myths and that we call reality now and so that concludes chapter two just a quite a profound light bulb oh yeah this is all made up type of moment and realization the next chapter takes a peek behind the curtain of the ages, examining what life was like in the millennia, separating the cognitive revolution from the agricultural revolution. If you thought the cognitive revolution was interesting, the agricultural revolution becomes even more interesting in how the, the function and the role of wheat changed the way we all function. But the next chapter three, A Day in the Life of Adam and Eve, will be the next video which you can go watch now or listen on all podcast platforms. 
and also eventually read in the transcriptions, transcribed versions on my website and medium.com. All the links are below in the description on YouTube, Facebook, and you can see snippets of these on Instagram. If you want to stay up to date and not miss any videos, subscribe, follow, do what you got to do to stay up to date. Hit notifications because you probably won't see them from YouTube anymore. And I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.